Today I'm going to give you a little introduction into just in general how a scientist views Parkinson's disease and then how the Parkinson's Institute comes together as an integrated institute that has clinical research, uh, a clinic, and basic science research together. So we're all here because we all know someone that has Parkinson's disease. Right? And each year there are about 50 to 60,000 people diagnosed with Parkinson's every year. It affects about 1 million people in the United States, and in sum, the cost of society is about $25 billion. And so what, what is Parkinson's? We generally describe it as a progressive neurodegenerative dis disorder. This means that you lose some brain cells, and it gets worse over time. And when we describe this in the clinic, we say that it's characterized by slow movements, rigidity, a resting tremor, and postural instability. And this is a drawing from Sir William Gowers in 1886 of a Parkinson's patient. So we see the, the stupid posture and postural instability. And what, it, what actually causes Parkinson's? And this is one of the things I wanted to tell you about today is, is what we're trying to do is figure out what causes these cells to be lost and then how we can find ways to make them uh, not be lost in the case of disease. So when we look at a Parkinson's brain, where are these cells that are lost? For a long time I worked on Parkinson's disease and had no idea exactly where because I was under, trying to understand the nitty gritty details. And so what happens is in your, in your midbrain, in your brainstem, you have a certain type of neurons that are colorized. And in this cartoon we can see that they're colored. And then in Parkinson's, although it's a little difficult to see here, those neurons are lost. And this is a section from an actual patient where in a normal patient, we can see these neurons are here. They're, they're melanized, and so they're darker colored. And in a PD patient, these neurons are gone. And these are the neurons that are lost that causes the symptoms of Parkinson's. Where are we at in terms of when someone is diagnosed with Parkinson's disease? So we see a certain amount of symptoms that come on over time. Right? And we also know that this is caused by a loss of neurons. And so one of our goals is try to find out how Parkinson's is started and how we can stop it. Because we need to be able to act before these neurons are lost and before you get so many symptoms you're diagnosed. I call this the inflection point because at, at this time, we don't have any way to stop the onset of disease. So you're not diagnosed with Parkinson's until you show up with all of the symptoms. And that's one of the goals here at the Parkinson's Institute is to find ways to predict the onset of disease. One of the ways that we've actually done this here is through some work in the clinical research group where they could see slight changes in how your heart rate looks on an EKG. And so just by sitting in the doctor's office for an extra four minutes and taking an EKG, there may be a way to predict whether you could get Parkinson's. And so some of these things that may be non-neurological, this is your heart. This is a, a non-brain symptom of Parkinson's disease. And so these are one of, the, one of the many ways that we're trying to detect Parkinson's before it's that time. Why do we need new new science? Why do we need to continue to study how disease starts? And it's been, one of the reasons is because many people have Parkinson's, but no two Parkinson's patients are the same. You can treat Parkinson's through exercise and speech therapy and dopamine replacement therapy, so your L-DOPA formulations. These are some of the ways that we treat Parkinson's, and then deep brain stimulation is where they can implant electrodes in your brain and help do some of the same things that the dopamine replacement therapy does. One of the problems is there's big side effects with these treatments that I'm sure many of you know about. And these are called levodopa-induced dyskinesias. So these are involuntary movements that are caused by the treatment for Parkinson's. And so most new therapeutics that are being developed today are different ways of administering this dopamine to you. And so we would have what I call an unmet need in Parkinson's disease because these are the only therapies we have to date. And they're not sufficient to completely restore a healthy lifestyle associated with PD. So, I'm a scientist, I'm a, I have a PhD, I'm not a physician, I see patients here at the Institute like this, and this is, I can tell you, a very beneficial thing for me. So when we try to think about what causes disease, right, for a long time, for over a hundred years, there's been a debate on exactly what may cause Parkinson's, right? So in 1877, a French neurologist named Charcot said paralysis, paralysis agitans or Parkinson's disease is not a familial disease. But at the same time, this Sir William Gower is the same guy who I showed you his drawing. He said many patients with disease have a strong family history. 
So over a hundred years ago, this debate was raging, and I can tell you that it raged for a long time. And one of the discoveries that was made by the founder of the Institute of the Parkinson's Institute, uh, Bill Langston, kind of shed light on a different way uh, to understand the onset of Parkinson's disease. There was an outbreak of in, 19, in the early 80s. There was an outbreak of young, suddenly frozen patients. And these were patients that had simply tried to make their own synthetic heroin, and they cooked it a little wrong in their garage. And when they presented to, to the uh, physicians at the doctor, and they asked, have you taken any drugs? They said, well, yes, we took heroin. And it turns out that um, through a lot of detective work, through a lot of people that still work here at the Parkinson's Institute, they found that there was a chemical that they had accidentally made and ingested, and that specifically killed the same kind of cells that are killed in Parkinson's disease. So why is this important? It's because for a very long time, we had no models for scientists to use to try to model disease so we can test out new drugs. And so this was established as a first toxicant-induced model of PD. So now they could take this same chemical and administer it to animals and give them Parkinson's similar to what people would get. And so this was the very first time that somebody could connect basic science research to patient care and go from what we call from the bench to bedside. And so with this history, Dr. Langston founded the Institute. <clears throat> and this was the first building of the Parkinson's Institute. It was in a small trailer. We've grown since then and have been successful. And this is the Parkinson's Institute now that we're all in. So, so one of the ways you can get Parkinson's is potentially through toxic exposures to things. And we have an epidemiological group here at the Parkinson's Institute that tries to understand exposures of people in certain professions and maybe the onset of Parkinson's disease. And so one of them, of course, is this compound that was found early on. Another one was uh, found that many people that have high exposures to pesticides can have Parkinson's. And it turns out the chemical structures of, this, of these two pesticides are very similar to this accidental intoxicant. And so through epidemiological group, through surveys of people in the population, we can find out things that they've been exposed to that may cause Parkinson's disease. And actually recently we had a very nice publication here from Sam Golden here at the Parkinson's Institute that identified a common um, groundwater contaminant called trichloroethylene as being uh, causative for Parkinson's disease in people that work in dry cleaners. So trichloroethylene is a compound that is heavily used in, in dry cleaning, but also in many, many other um, uh, industries like silicon manufacturing. So, you know, it turns out trichloroethylene is one of the most common groundwater contaminants in, the, in California. And so it's through these type of discoveries that we can find out new ways that people may get Parkinson's and then therefore how we could stop them from getting it in the future. I've told you that you can get it through being exposed to some chemicals, but I'll tell you that a majority of the people that get Parkinson's, we don't know why. And we call this sporadic Parkinson's disease. Now, I've told you that you can have some environmental factors that can cause disease. But we've also found that there are some familial forms of disease. So you can inherit a mutation from your parents, and that could predispose you to getting Parkinson's. One of the very interesting things is that if you get Parkinson's through environmental exposure or through an inherited mutation, and I'll try to tell you a little bit about what this is in a minute, that the types of Parkinson's look very similar. And so when scientists look at these cases of Parkinson's disease, we think that maybe this is a way to start finding out how the disease starts. And as a scientist, when I started looking at Parkinson's and started studying it and, and wanting to make this my profession, you know, I looked at it very simply and I thought of Parkinson's disease as kind of everybody being a house on stilts. And at some time, you lose one of these stilts and that makes your house a little unstable. And so, this would be a decent explanation, but one of the problems is we don't know what these stilts that you're actually losing. We don't know what goes wrong yet. And so we think that by understanding how the environmental exposures and also how the familial mutations, the inherited mutations that you get from your parents, since they look just like regular Parkinson's disease, that they may shed light on each other. And so in my view, we're taking these new ways of understanding how Parkinson's starts to put names on these stilts. And now that we have names to these stilts, we can start to try to put them back in place. And so, why is the Parkinson's Institute a very good place to do research? And I'll say one of the first things is that we have a clinic. So here at the PI, 
We have people that do all kinds of research, but one of the best, one of the most important parts of our mission is the clinic. And it's the clinic that sees patients and helps um, deal with their disease. And we also have many, many clinical trials that go on in the clinic. So we have over clinic, 25 clinical trials that are ongoing now for new drugs that may help symptoms or stop the onset of disease. And so this is a very big resource for us and also everybody that has Parkinson's. I've told you a little bit about the clinical research team, a little bit about how they try to understand what causes Parkinson's disease. And we also have a basic science research team. So we have people with PhDs and some with MDs that do research at the bench to try to understand what goes wrong to find out what causes Parkinson's so we can stop it. And so we have this interrelated and connected team of people that look at Parkinson's from all aspects, from disease onset, and to try to stop it. And I've told you a lot about inherited mutation. I've said the word mutation many, many times. And for me, <coughs> these are, um, uh, this is one of the things, you know, I mean, you can tell this to anybody, but the concept is that this is, the, this is what we call the central dogma in science. Scientists should rarely be dogmatic, but sometimes we are. And this is, in general, how we think we end up looking how we look. Right? So everybody's heard of genes and DNA, but what are genes and DNA? They're essentially what encode how we look. And that, is actually occur that actually happens through a process that is complicated, but it turns out that this is the, the genetic code of your life. So this encodes all of the proteins, and we're all made up of proteins. And so sometimes you may get a mutation. This may be caused from environmental exposure or some type of um, chemical that causes something like cancers, right? We've heard of some chemicals being able to cause cancers, and this is because they will mutate your DNA. And when I say mutate, I just want you to know that in the code of life, where this should be a certain letter, we have a different letter. And so the code is a little wrong. And this X gets output all the way through how we look today. And so one of the things that we had to do was first find where the X's were, and now we have to find out how the X's exert their effects. And this is some of the things that my lab does. So I told you that we can have mutations from your parents that cause Parkinson's disease. There have been a lot of studies that have tried to find out what of these mutations are associated with disease. And so they'll look at a thousand people with Parkinson's disease. They'll sequence their genomes, and then they'll look for these X's. And it turns out they have found over 20 X's that have been associated with Parkinson's disease. And so we have a very large base that we can work off of to start putting names on these stilts. One of the problems is, is sometimes, even though we put a name to it, we don't know what these guys do. We don't know their jobs. And so one of the, one of the things that when you want to understand what these proteins do, you also want to make drugs towards them. And drugs can only be made against certain kinds of, of uh, proteins in the cell. And we are fortunate that many of these things that are noted by arrows and boxes are what we call druggable targets. So these are, these are targets that drug companies can put their chemists on to make new drugs. And without the understanding that we can have mutations that cause disease, we would not have these new targets. And I'll tell you about one of the targets that my lab works on. It is the most commonly found mutation in Parkinson's. It's called LRRK2. The particulars aren't, interest, aren't, aren't necessary for you to know, but it's the most common one found. Now, this is the way that scientists will represent a certain gene, right? So I showed you just kind of squiggles that was DNA before. And this is to represent this protein LARC2 that's the most frequently found mutation in Parkinson's disease. And if they sequence the genomes of everybody with Parkinson's, it turns out that they can find over 50 different X's in this gene. In one single gene, you can have 50 different mutations that may cause Parkinson's. So we focus on the most common ones, and these are boxed in red. And one of the things that we need to do is to understand how these change the job or the role of this protein in the cell. And so one of the things we do is to try to determine how these things behave. Now, this is a very complicated slide, but I'm pretty sure that everybody's seen any stock market portfolio, any type of uh, retirement fund you have. These are bar graphs. And so the bigger the bar, the more money you have. This turns out to measure the 
function of this enzyme in a test tube. And so if we look at one of the most common mutations, it has a whole lot more activity than the ones that don't have a mutation. And so though this is complicated, we're trying to get this amount to go back down to this amount. And to do that, we'll use drugs. For the focus of our lab, we think that if you get a familial mutation, a mutation from your mom or dad, that that causes some type of neuronal dysfunction that we've yet to identify. And we know that in Parkinson's disease, you get a similar kind of neuronal dysfunction. And so we think that there may be some connections to not just, con not just what people have with Parkinson's, or with, with familial mutation, but this may be happening with everybody with Parkinson's disease. And so, we're hoping to be able to partner with pharmaceutical companies to develop drugs that may stop this dysfunction. Though we don't know exactly what this is, and my lab is focused on understanding that, we want to stop this bad stuff from happening. Because if these dysfunctions occur, if these um, inappropriate activities, or however you want to describe it, we get the neuronal death that causes Parkinson's disease. And so the way that we're approaching it is to look for new targets, that we can target with new drugs. I've told you a little bit about how the Parkinson's Institute works, how we uh, are focused on the clinic and how we integrate a lot of the information from around the institute, a lot of our researchers and scientists. And we also want to collaborate with industry. You know, a lot of people don't like pharmaceutical companies, but I'll tell you, my blood pressure is near normal because of it. My mom and dad are still around because of it. And they're the ones that are going to make the drugs to make us better. And one of the best things we can do is not wait for them to read what we put out in the public literature. We have to call them ahead of time and say, hey, I've got this idea. What do you think? And it turns out if you do that enough, if you have access to clinical trial facilities like the Parkinson's Institute, they become very interested in your ideas. And so what we're doing is trying to leverage the pharmaceutical industry to get experimental and therapeutic progress. And at the same time, they look at our capabilities and what we do and try to leverage us for experimental and therapeutic progress. This is a mutually beneficial way to engage all entities that want to make a difference in Parkinson's. And so here at the Parkinson's Institute, I think that what we do as an academic or research institute is to try to break down these walls that exist between us and industry. It's because it only, the way, only in this way and only in a, in a system that we have can we have this free flow of information between the two of these entities so that we can get new discoveries and then make new therapies and cures. And it's the integrated approach that we have here at the Parkinson's Institute that focus on elucidating the causes of disease while we're caring for the people that have disease while we're trying to make a cure. And this is why we say we have cause, care, and cure. So, in a little bit, you'll hear from other people that work here at the Parkinson's Institute, and we uh, interrelate with them very well. So Yang Ping Lee will come up and tell you about new genetic models of disease that she uses. And then we'll hear from Dr. Tanner at the, from the epidemiological group. We'll tell you how they try to look for associations of exposure in the onset of disease. And then you'll hear from uh, Dr. Shule, who will come and tell you about how she's using uh, patient samples to make stem cell models of disease. So this is a very exciting time to be in Parkinson's research because I think that we're on the cusp of, a new, of new discoveries to make these therapies happen. And the people in my lab that work on these things are listed here. And this is the funding that my lab receives. And you'll notice none of these things, except for one little bit, is from federal sources of funding. All of the funding we get at the Parkinson's Institute, the majority of it comes from private foundations and not the federal government. The federal government does not fund research at a level that allows us to be successful and to drive new discoveries. And so we find new ways to engage uh, foundations, and such as the Michael J. Fox Foundation and the Brin Wojcicki Foundation, to actually move the needle a little farther, a little faster. And so if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to entertain them. And uh, shortly, Yang can 